Our next speaker, at every point, okay, let me just go ahead. So our next speaker is a powerhouse. She's one that needs no introduction, but I will do one regardless. She is the global citizen, proudly African, of Nigerian descent and Northern Eastern Nigerian extraction. A modern governor's 100 honorary for diligent, a world leading GRC and SAS corporation, a recipient of the International Society for Performance Improvement. Highest individual award, the Thomas F. Gilbert Distinguished Professional Achievement Award. She is the author of several professional articles and book ch chapters, late books, African Leaders Teeth at Teeth, Navigating Entity Design and pro sorry, Prioritization for Systematic Outcomes, released October 2022, has been well received. Happily married to Dr. Gabriel Rotimi, three interesting adult personalities, Samson, Solomon, and Noble, a sons and a beautiful teen stepdaughter, Esther. A round of applause for our speaker, Dr. Lucy Newman. Newman. Come on now, you can do better than that. You can do better than that. Hit it up higher, hit it up higher. Come on, come on, come on. Keep it up till she gets here. Thank you very much. Good morning, all. It's a pleasure to be here. And Mark, that was awesome. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. I would like to just say I am very honored to be here. It's always a pleasure to be here. I speak. Today I'm speaking as a professional person, eh? but I'm some people's mama or oh. some people's mama. Huh? Some people's mama, my son Samson is, um, okay, if I say my son now, my husband will fight me. Our son. <laughs> Our son Samson is 35. The younger one, his next brother is 28. Noble is 22. Esther is 16. So I think we relate very well with everybody in this room. I want us to catch something from what Mr. Idiahi said. May the soul of your brother rest in peace. And we see how he has used his pain to do something great. I pray that all of us, the things that we don't like or we're not happy about, for those who are pastors in the room, they will tell you that your source of pain is your area of mission because there's fire in your belly. You are inspired from within. If you don't like people being maltreated, you're going to stand for people to be advocated for. So what is, ah, good to see you, my brother. You see this place, we are now doing a club. Mark, you need to create a club of all former speakers and our days. We'll have a ball at the 10th event by the grace of God. God keeping us alive, eh? This morning, I'm going to talk to us about leveraging governance and institutional capacity for economic transformation of Africa. By the grace of God, I've traveled around Africa. I've gone to almost half the countries on the continent. I've met people. I've spoken to people. We're all people, and we have the same yearning in our hearts. I know most people complain, ah, slave trade, this is what happened. But we can use that as driving force to say never again and we will determine our own destiny. So I have a lot of pictures in my presentations. You see this African <laughs> map is people or human beings. Another thing people don't know about Africa, I will tell you. Over the course of the next few minutes, first of all, next slide please. I have a disclaimer that this paper, what I'm saying now, please. It's just for people that are either attending here or being online or engaged in this process. I don't owe anybody outside this group an explanation. And the essence is for us to be inspired to go out and I'm going to be speaking on a practical dimension. Next slide. 
over the next few minutes, I will talk and I'll cover four things. You know, when people talk about something, they speak big grammar. I'm not going to speak big grammar this morning. We're going to get the basics on the topic, every word in the topic that Mr. Idiahi has given me. I'll paint a scenario why Africa were both rich and absolutely poor, unfortunately so. And then requirements, how can we solve it? What is required in line with the topic that I have shared? And then the continuum, our individual and collective points. And I like the point that Mr. Idiahi brought out. It's all of us, each and every one of us. And you know what, when he was speaking, I just chuckled. I remembered all my children that went to school in the tertiary in the, uh, university. I, I look forward to when our universities will be allowed uh, in such a way that students who are in school can have work hours. In some schools, they give you 20 hours a week. Some schools, they give you 40 hours when you're on holidays. During those 20 hours, you can do small, small jobs now, and you can earn your money by hour, and you learn skills. By the time you come out, you won't be looking for work, you know? For instance, all of my children, they do their work during their school time. So it's all of us, it's collective. Can we go to next slide, please? So as I said, next slide, next slide. There's a conversation going on. Next slide. <laughs> Don't distract him or while I'm here, he's protected. He's under my protection. Nobody should come around this area. So the next slide is for us to get to the basics. Basics of the topic. Sometimes the topics, they bring us big, big grammar. So I broke it down. If you remember my topic is leveraging governance. Next slide. My topic is leveraging governance and institutional capacity for Africa's economic transformation. So what is it? I define leverage. Leverage as being intentionally goal-oriented. What do you want to achieve? Focusing on the outcomes of what process you want to attain. Keeping the end goal in mind. One of our sons, Solomon, at the beginning of the year, he will sit down in front of, he will see a list of his subjects. He will put the list of his subjects. He will say, hmm, by the end of this year, in this class, I'll be second. In this class, I'll be third. What am I going to do? Secondary school, and by the time it is speech and prize giving day, he will come back and say, I've ticked this one, <laughs> I've ticked this one, I've ticked this one. So if that is an individual, and many of you, I'm sure, at school, you do that, right? How many people do that? How many of us have done that before? In fact, when I was in university, I used to come back after the exam. Why people are celebrating, yay, exam has finished. I will go back to my question paper. I will take my textbook, I will score myself, I will decide, okay, I've aced this one. I'm not even going to check the result. I'll just come back next semester and I'll register. So that kind of focus is very important for us to achieve what we want to. Then the other one is governance. Sadly, that's the area where I work. But many people claim that they know governance, but in engagement, you find out that they really don't know. Yesterday I had a conversation with somebody. At the end of the day, me and my husband, I was so drained. I said, this person is very highly placed. He thinks he knows it. But actually, he doesn't know it. And everybody, you know, just put up the show, do random bullshit talk, you know, RBS. You know, RBS, we used to call it random bullshit. You just talk as if you know it and walk away. But the governance is actually the act of using processes, systems, and data in a way that you can be, know the transparency of the whole system and you can, with good information, Take a decision to give oversight and to ensure that those goals you set, you are on track. And if you have missed it, you come back and recalibrate. That's all it requires. The institutional capacity is actually for, Mark mentioned it in his keynote, that it is about the ability to plan, to use your resources, and to move and mobilize everything you have, human material and everything, and then be able to pursue a goal and if you're on that journey you find out that you're not doing well step back rethink adjust and keep going so that come rain come shine you're sustainable you keep going either as a person or as a human being we have institutional capacity even you as a person the mc told us you went to market you saw 500 naira tomorrow you come back it's 1500 what's going to happen first calibration is it made in nigeria second calibration can i make it myself <laughs> Third calibration, is it important? If I don't take it, will I die? These are all calibrations, Abby. Then you now adjust, you keep moving. Will you say because it's 1,500, you go and kill yourself and bring 1,000? No. 
And guess what? Demand and supply. If the person has it in the shop and people are not buying, after some time they will have to, it's going to expire, right? They will bring down the price. So the other aspect is economic transformation. We've been talking, 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 economic transformation. Even you as a person, what's the economic transformation? I need skills, though. I have to scale up. I don't know something. What am I going to read? What am I going to improve myself with? When I was working, I, I'm still working in somehow, somehow. I took an early retirement. Now work is hobby and ministry. When I was full-time work, I used to keep myself. Oh, I remove my money. Part of it is my, my social obligation, my religious obligation. I keep one. I call it the me fund. That me fund is for me to be able to do my hair, do my nails, for me to buy a book or go for a program, or for me just to chill out. That is important. I call it my own personal capacity investment for transformation. So for us, we have been talking as a country. We say we're going to diversify. I want to diversify. But there's another side. There's one country that did something. I will tell us. Because all these definitions I have done, at the end, I will show us how countries have applied it in practical sense. We've been talking about diversity. If you used to produce mangoes, and you used to pluck the mangoes, and you sell it in the local market, that's one level of economic activity. If you now decide that those are your mangoes, you are going to build a hut nearby, and you're going to employ some people who are going to trim the mango, brush it, wash it, polish it, wrap it in uh, individual packs so that the moisture is not inside, and you put it in a basket, and you put it in a carton, you put it in your brand. That one that you sold straight from the farm and the one that you sold in the packet with value add, that is a form of transformation because you've added value, you've added skills, and you're bringing it to a higher level. I will tell us there's one country that I have visited. But first of all, in line with this topic that we have said, what do we want to achieve before, by the time I go back to sit down? We want to see how we, as Africans, I know there's something. <laughs> oh, Lord. I went somewhere, and me and my Egyptian sister were sitting next to each other, and we were talking with this Caucasian lady from Europe. And we said, we're all Africans. She said, no, I am African, the other lady from Egypt. Uh, she doesn't look African. I was like, excuse me? She doesn't look African. How? I knew why she said she didn't look African, because the Egyptian lady was looking like Asian. She's not white. She's not black. So she was saying the Egyptian lady is not African. I said, I have bad news for you. If you go to Tunisia, you go to Angola, you go to Egypt, <laughs> you see many of them like that, and we're all Africans. So most people think that Africans are dark people, sub-Saharan, but that is another issue. So we as Africans... We should put our hands together. I didn't say our head. We have been taking our heads for a long time. It's time for us to put our hands. It's not an error. Our hands together to attain economic transformation, use governance and institutional capacity on a personal, organizational, and national levels. Many times we put our hands in the air and surrender and say, they in Abuja, they in Alausa. No, we the people, as Africans, as individuals. Next slide, please. However, this picture, I want us to take it in. Look at it very well. This is Africa. Oh. The guy on the other side, his shoes are, no, he had a swag. The shoes are leather, polished, expensive shoe. The one on the other side, there's a problem, right? Have we ever seen any of the two around in Nigeria or in Africa? Who has never seen any of these two before? Anybody? Who has seen this before? Thank you very much. One big one that we can see is when you're away from Ikeja, coming to the island on Third Mainland, you look straight, you see the buildings, and you see the beautiful streets. And they look right. You see, okay, I won't. Is it not an irony? And they're all Lagosians, right? Who has ever been to a place like Okeabon before? Any show of hands? Who knows Okeabon? Nobody knows Okeabon? Okay, that place. The houses are on stilts. They're standing in water. They move between houses in a canoe. That water is also toilet, is also transportation system. Is well. 
So Africa, this next slide, please. We're both poor and we're both rich. I will tell us, if I tell us the wealth and the poverty, I hope that it will now ginger you. And by the time we finish, I will show examples of what some other countries have done in this area in practical sense. Africa is the second largest and second most populous continent after Asia. One of the Earth's last remaining gardens with Asia. Now, in land mass, we are 30.3 million kilometers, you know, including the adjacent lands. And we cover 6% of the Earth's total surface and 20% of its land area. So 20% of the land area in the world is on the continent. It's surrounded by the upper side, by Mediterranean Sea, to the north. That's the area that our brother Mark spoke about. And the east of the Suez and the Red Sea on the northeast side on the flank. And then the Indian Ocean to the southeast and the Atlantic Ocean to the west, which is what we have in Lagos. Africa is oceanic, one of the most oceanic continents that we have. Heavily affected because of this by environmental issues, desertification, deforestation, water, flooding. I'm from Borno State. How many people know about the flood in Borno? 70, 80% of the land mass. That is also another topic. When we get into it, you find out that that thing shouldn't have happened. Somebody somewhere dropped the ball. That's another issue. We're also the youngest continent. The World Economic Forum reported that out of the 20 youngest countries by demography in the world, 19 are in Africa. Can you imagine that? Out of the 20 youngest, you know, Mark told us Nigeria has the youngest, <laughs> the largest population of the young people in the world. This is in the world, the 20. Africa has 20, 19 out of, 19 countries in Africa out of the top 20 that have the youngest population. So Africa is a young continent. And anything that happens in Africa does not include the young or wasting time. We're also growing very fast, but we're very productive. <laughs> we're very productive. We're 18% of the world's population of 8.02. And we grow at more than 2% annually. In fact, in some parts of the country, they grow faster. I know in the north, by the time you see a girl that is 26, she might have six children. Can we go to the next slide? So for those of us who like pictures, all I said is that Africa, we have five regions. The regions are here. And guess what? Because of our historic past in terms of colonialism, see the, see the languages, official languages, yeah, the foreign, the influence of Europe on Africa. Belgian, Spanish, British, French, independent, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish. If we throw in Swahili and all that. So this is the Europe influence in Africa. This is the language. These are the languages that are spoken officially in Africa. But guess what? Africa as a continent is diverse in language. 1,500, 1,500 to 2,000 African languages. Do you see why we have a communication problem? I go to some places in East Africa and everybody is speaking, speaking Kiswahili. I say in Nigeria, by that you start speaking from uh, one local government in Bono State, before you get to the non next local government, nobody understands you because in my state, we have about 14 in Africa. In Nigeria, we have about 500 and something languages. So how do we understand one another? And not all of us are educated, can speak English. Next slide, please. I don't like this, you know, but that's the truth. The World Bank predicts that Sub-Saharan Africa will be home to more than 1 billion people, half of whom will be under 25 years by 2050. Imagine a place so, you know the reason, if there's nothing you remember in what I'm saying, by 2050, God, God keeping us alive and things continuing the way they are, Predicting is that by 2050, half of the world's population of 1 billion that are younger than 25 years will be in Africa. That's, that's fantastic. You, now you see why some of the OECD countries, 
where people are getting old, they are not giving birth, and they need people to work. They are giving all these juicy arrangements for people to come over and work because they don't have the population. So I think that also can be used positively if we think very well. This is very depressing for me. And if you look at the pictures, you see that picture at the last end. If there was a pointer, the one in the top right corner, you see a beautiful high brow area and you see a slummish area. Both of them are in the same town, separated by vegetation. You see a lot of construction, mining happening in Africa. Yet you see poverty. Some people, if some of the schools that they show, there's one guy that refurbished a school for 4.5 million. How many of us saw it in Kano? Social media, the thing was viral. Yeah, he 4.5 million, he transformed the classroom. And then he said there were 50 something schools that needed that. And yet there's somebody called Commissioner for Education. And there's a budget for Ministry of Education. The other one is Agri. See this lush, beautiful farm that this lady is farming. Both the left, where people are hungry and starving, and the right are at the same place with all this. When I read this, I was very sad. You know, my paper is called Economic Transformation for Africa. Africa's nom you know, nominal per capita GDP recorded a net change of minus $81 from 2023 in the year 2023, which was oh, funny. I checked it many times to be sure it's not typo, to 1,942 in 2024. Africa got a minus, but the whole world increased by 431 from 12,740 to 13,171. The fact that we're even at 1,000, why the, country, the world is like six times what we are. Then if you look at other continents, they improved. Asia, South America, Europe, Asia, Oceania, even Oceania improved more. We took a backward step. Meanwhile, we have African continental free trade area. We have Agenda 2063. Why did Africa's nominal GDP drop? Anybody? Who do you th what do you think it dropped? From 2023 to 2024. Anybody? We're talking. Anybody? Or well, somebody Don't worry, there's no correct and wrong answer. We won't say you failed. Huh? Why do we think I'll tell us one of them. Insecurity. People can't go to the farm, they're scared of kidnap. And also in other places, they are fighting Sudan. I also tell us weather, drought. In Namibia, they had drought. And there was something on the news that they have listed some animals that were going to be taken down so that they can provide protein for the people because of the drought. I was also in Botswana. The land is dry, so productivity is low. Then the third one is politics. Politicians are playing politics. Very few of them are doing development. Africa must not be stepping backwards. We have everything. Majority of God's blessings of rich minerals are under our feet in Africa. We need to transform that. So, next slide, please. On this depressive note, I want to encourage us. There's hope, and I want to show us that things are working in other parts of Africa. It's just for us to look at it as, as my level and as where I come from and how I'm working. Wherever country you are logging, logging in from, whichever part of Africa you are this morning, I want to share some stories of some of our brothers and sisters and how they've, they're working on things. It might not be correct, it might not be perfect, but the fact that something is happening and they are working on it together, that is a promise that we should hold on to. So how, if you don't have it in your own country, how can we be part of that? If they don't invite you, make your own table. Sit down there. When you do it right, they will come to your table. That's the story. So how do we do it? I want to take us shopping. You see, we're going to go shopping. Going shopping doesn't mean you have to buy anything. Some of us specialize in going around the shops, asking the price, looking at the items, and coming back home without buying anything. You just maybe buy meat, pie, and drink, and come back and sleep. Many people do that in ShopRite. 
you see some of their bags, the bags that they are coming out of shop right with. Before they used to come with trolley, now we just come back, nothing in the hand. If you look, maybe sometimes a bottle of mineral that is in the hand and a, and a snack that was bought. There's nothing wrong with shopping. Yeah? You go window shopping. Don't come back depressed from shopping. Just say, there is hope. <laughs> I am fine. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, this slide, yes. This first one. I gave us the definition of leverage, yeah? So, how do we get leverage? I rem remember we said intentionally, I'm almost wrapping up now. I'm in the final end of my stuff. I want to tell us how it's done and I'll challenge each of us and then I'll be done. In case you are tired of me standing here or the timer is looking. So, intentionally goal-oriented thinking, focusing on outcomes and processes for policy. How do we do that? You get a data-driven planning and decision-making, inclusive engagement, and patriotism and leadership. First of all, some countries do not have sensors. They don't even know how many they are. Then also, <laughs> the engagement is not enough. When they want to talk about something about their country, they hear about it on the media that this is what is being sown. Many people do not have opportunity to have town hall meetings with their leaders and all that to tell them what they want to do and to ask of their opinion. It's good to ask of the opinion. And I saw this. I saw this in Tanzania. I saw it in Namibia. I saw it in Botswana. And I saw it in Rwanda. How did I see it? These countries, Tanzania and Namibia, they have sensors, validated data. If you want, go to their website. Check how many people are certain ages, how many people live somewhere. When they do census, they don't do census to determine where the pulling boot will be. They do census to know how many people are here. Do they need water? Do they need hospital? Is there a road that connects it? And what kind of thing do they do? So census is for planning. It's for decision making. It's not just to say how many pulling boots and how many votes. No. That has to change. And Tanzania, they know exactly. There was even a time that they had a school, and they felt that in that school, their toilets were the old toilet system. They had a program whereby they transitioned all the schools that had pit toilets to water systems and all that. If you don't have data, how would you do that? I know in Namibia, they had data. When I, approved, when I appreciated that they had data was at COVID. We went to one of the provinces because I was on a project, I went to one of the provinces, and in those provinces, I saw some old people queuing up. What was it? The retired folks, they had a welfare system whereby every person that was a citizen had a certain, instead of saying they are buying rice to give you, no, every citizen had a certain amount of Namibian dollars, cash, given to them to go sort themselves out. And indigent children that did not have anybody, they had a certain amount allowance per month so that the relatives and the guardians can take care of. If you can't do things like that without data. And every 10 years, they have a census. And every 10 years, they look at their constitution, review it. Are there anybody, is there anybody online from Namibia? Show of hands. <laughs> Administrator, let's see if there's anybody from Namibia online. And they have census every 10 years. And they look at the web. <laughs> when I saw it, I was like, whoa. Their constitution was a very small book like this. Everybody has it. Wherever you want, you go pick it at the minute at the government offices. It's free. And every 10 years, at every province, they have like a town hall for people to come and give what they want to be changed in that constitution. And they rank the top 10. And they collect it by center. And they do national. And at the end of the day, they take the national top 10 things that are supposed to be updated and they will do it in the next round. And they do it every 10 years and with sensors to be able to plan. That's how leverage can be used. Now, governance. Using processes and systems and data to enable transparency for oversight of strategic direction. How do we do that? I already talked about sensors and analytics. Governance frameworks and codes. I also mentioned that I saw it in Namibia and South Africa. They have governance codes. Whether you are a private sector, whether you are a small business, whether you are a large corporate, there's a framework, there's a governance system, and there's an agency that monitors compliance 
to these governance systems and they follow the process. That was very beautiful to behold. I pray that other African countries will also do the same. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, you're looking at those who are... Next slide. <laughs> you, you are online. You're also investing monitoring online. Did you see any hand from Namibia? No hand. Okay, no hand. Okay. Go to the next slide, the one that has the next... That starts from institutional capacities. Yes. Institutional capacity... Okay, institutional capacity. Uh, you've gone ahead of me. Oh. You've got to go back. <laughs> go back to slide 14. Are you sending me away? You're going fast. <laughs> okay, institutional capacity. Institutional ca Oh, he wants to check me whether, you know, I said I'm, I'm almost done. He wants to confirm that I'm going. He went forward to see whether Madame is telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. I bear no falsehood. So, institutional capacity is ability to set and achieve aspirational goals. You remember? How do you do that? Ministries, departments, and agencies have strategic plans. They have KPIs, and they have collectively drawn national plan, and these things are monitored. Again, I saw this thing live in South Africa and Namibia. I saw their local governments. It was in 20, 2021, and the local governments had audited accounts for 2020. How do you think I felt as a Nigerian being there as a consultant? <laughs> Many of the agencies in my country, 10 years, when they will publish one account, they say it's an achievement. Here I was as a consultant in a country where the local government had a heat map. If you go now, Google Statistics South Africa, and you go to the uh, South African Ministry for Public Enterprise, you see the performance indicators of all these local governments. That's how it is done in institutional capacity, so that they will have a meeting and they will decide what is working. I was in Botswana last month. They had a session. They do that session every two years. They invited me to go and speak. So I was thinking, oh, give me a flyer so that I will promote this. And they said, no, 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 no. They are, not they are not interested in international participants. It's their own national conversation. It's hosted by the Business Botswana, which is the business, the chamber. What is it about every two years? They come together, they plan, they look at things, they go. And they come back in two years, they see how it is done. I was like, whoa, wouldn't that be beautiful? I hope other countries would do the same thing. Economic transformation, I also have an example of two countries. It's continuous improvement and moving labor resources from lower to higher. It gave us the example of the mango farm and the packaging and the value add. I saw this live in Botswana. How many of us know that Botswana recently they found the biggest diamond? Have you heard the story? Big rock, eh? Big one like this. <laughs> Ogolobo, eh? <laughs> Odogu. <laughs> so, Botswana, mm, very interesting. I learned that some of their parents do not know what school fees is because everybody has scholarship up to secondary school. You just choose your school and you go to it. The schools actually tell you you should come so that they will have more students, so that they can get more allocation. Then at university, they get scholarships. Yes, my time is almost up. I'm finished. They get, my time is almost up. I know. Take the piece of paper away. <laughs> so they give me, they, they give them scholarships. When they give them scholarships, How did they do that? When they got independence about 50 years ago, yeah, 50 something years ago, Botswana was one of the poorest countries, but they made one law. People were mining diamonds and exporting, and the law came out that you cannot export raw diamonds. You have to polish and cut in Botswana. That was transformative, it was value added, because it created jobs and all that, and the value of the export now increased, and the country got more, more money. So, as I wrap up, this is my last section, the continuum. The continuum is a continuous process and it's all of us, so me, you, all of us. Right from, right from primary school, by the time you tell a child that when you drink Coke, when you get paper, you don't put them in the same place. That's part of it. When you pour water, get stick mop and mop it. 
It's all of us. From all I've said, each country, next slide, please. Thank you. Each country needs to update a constitution to enable subnationals play their role as expected. So we have Agenda 2063 and we have AFTA. Agenda 2063 came on board about 11 years ago. And we have AFTA that came on board in 2021, which it means that if your country's constitution is older than this, that means it's no longer relevant to the new environment. That's a business case for every country to look at its constitution at least every 10 years. And also to look at your census every 10 years. So that you look at your census, then you plan. Then you progress. If you look at the countries that are making development speed in Africa, pick their number and then ask when was it that they did their last census and when was it that they did their last constitutional review. I can bet you some people have even done their review twice since the beginning of the Agenda 2063. Citizens at home and in diaspora and residents need engagement. I get angry when all that we tell our diaspora Africans is bring money and we can't allow them to vote. Voting is not a favor, it's their right. They work so hard, they send their money home. You want the money and you don't want them to decide who should be chosen? That is another form of apartheid. They are not slaves of Africa, they are citizens of Africa. I've always been saying it, that voting is a right. And I felt that it's not every country that should say, I will think about it, we'll come back tomorrow. No, African Union should say, hey guys, by this time, develop the platform to enable the diaspora voting. We need data. And Africans need to know their own continent. My children know, before we go elsewhere, oh, they've gone everywhere. They've gone to Kenya, they've gone to Ghana, they've gone to Ethiopia. I take them to, there's a terror museum. If you want, Google terror museum. It's a nasty place. The type of leadership that Africa should never have. When, Egypt, when Ethiopia decided to take all their elites and psh, their bones and their shoes are in that place. So I take my children there. I also take them to Ghana, Elmina Castle, the ship where they, the ship carried the slaves. I tell them, when you go abroad, do not forget these two things, yeah? But you can go. <laughs> that is very important for us to know our history. And some of the Africans I've seen are very patriotic people. So I want to leave us with this question as I go back to my seat. Otherwise, the MC will come and stand next to me. Mark told us about voting. How many of us are of voting age here? I think all of us, right? Is there anybody less than 18 in this room? If you are less than 18, please raise your hand. Thank you. Less than 18. When you become 18, would you like to vote? You have to start learning by now. Uh -huh. So those of us who are of voting age, how many of us voted? That's where it starts from. I'm watching River State. Oh, there's drama in that place. Now, one of it is for us to vote and to pay taxes because taxes provide services. When you pay taxes, you hold them accountable. But if you don't pay tax, you are hiding from tax. You will not be able to challenge them. The other side, again, is engage in public discourse pre and post election. Let your voice be heard positively. The last one is know your senator and your member of house of parliament. How many of us know our senator? Me, I know my own. I even have his phone number. Hello? <laughs> your senator and your speaker, know them. Your governor, you may not reach the person, but your local government person, know the person. Read about the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. Even if you're a child in school, in secondary school, in university, please, you can make t-shirts, you can do barbing, you have clipper, you barb hair for your classmates, they pay you. You have small sewing machine, you make clothes, you cut hair, you do weave on, you braid hair for them. Find something to do that is value add and also make sure that you pay attention to all these things. Do not wait to be invited to the table. As long as you can breathe, as long as you can see, you can hear, you have a right to be heard and you are a contributor. Don't sit back and watch. Get involved, even in the family. Get involved. And I beg parents, please, encourage your children to step up. Don't make them keep quiet. Even at the family table, let there be a debate. They learn it at home. If they can't speak, we should do it in interviews. Some children will come to interview, and you're talking to them. They can't look up and see you. 
Because at home, they used to say, what's wrong with you? You are looking me in the eye. And in an employment interview, that will show us if the person has no self-confidence. Self-confidence starts from whom? And that is, please, pamper your daughters, make them feel like princesses. So that when they grow up, if anybody come and say, okay, you fine, you say, uh -huh, my daddy has told me. What else? Do you understand? Thank you very much. Thank you so